am so excited to kick off today and hopefully today's topic um, just spurs something exciting in you. Seeing the topic of wellness, at first I kind of freaked out because over the last few months, I've literally felt like I was in survival mode. Um, if any of you have been fortunate enough to be through a first trimester, you are exhausted and tired and nauseous and all of the things. And so when I looked at this topic, I wanted to stay in total alignment with who I am and where my gifts are. And I wanted to kind of pivot it slightly. And so today what we're going to be talking about is boundaries, because boundaries are something that I am obsessed with. And the more research that I do surrounding setting boundaries when it comes to relationships and work and personal boundaries, the more that I see that it really plays a role in our health, in our relationships, in our work, in our well-being. So I wanted to kick this off with a very quick story, because maybe you are finding yourself in a similar situation. So the other day I was hanging out with my daughter Coco and I got a text message from one of my friends and she's an amazing, amazing person. She's the CEO of a company. She messaged me and she said, Hey, I'm, I'm launching this book. Well, could you do this interview with me? It would mean so much to me. I want you to be a part of this book launch. And I'm juggling a toddler on my hip. And I'm like, uh, yes, yes, I will. And I didn't give myself time to actually think like, do I have the bandwidth for this? Is this going to work with my schedule? Is, is this going to not just serve her, but also serve me and where I'm at? And over the next few days, she texted a few times to follow up with me. And I kind of felt this like sinking feeling. Have you ever committed to something? And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I don't, I don't know if this is the right thing. I don't know if this is the right alignment. Like, I don't know. And so She's texting me and I can feel this hesitation in me. Like I, I wanted to pretend like I didn't read the text because I, I didn't know how to respond and I didn't know how to politely back out. And, and I've uncovered so much over the years that so many of us are innately people pleasers, right? Like there's nothing better than serving others, making them feel valued, bringing them joy. And we're taught that from a young age. And so after a few days, she finally texted me. She said, you know what? I'm going to let you off the hook on this. You are so busy. You're growing a human. I can sense that you've got a lot on your plate. And I just want to give you the grace to step away from this. And I immediately felt this sense of relief, like, oh, thank you. Thank you. And then I wrote her back and I just said, thank you so much. I truly wanted to support you, but you're right. This is just too much for me right now. And if she wouldn't have stepped in, I probably would have continued on that path of dread and feeling like I wasn't going to fully show up. And it made me realize, okay, let's think about these boundaries and how we are setting them in place, not just in our lives, but, but in our work and the way that we show up. I had a team call the other day and my team is all women. And we were on the call and I said, how many of you guys felt a little anxious last week? And almost every hand went up. And I was like, okay, what's going on with the moon right now? Are we in a different lunar phase? Like what's happening? Is there something going on? And I think that there is a lot of anxiety building for so many of us as the world starts to open up, something that we're all very excited about. Um, but for so many of us, myself included, um, I've kind of thrived in, in more of an isolated environment. I'm introverted. I've learned to like feel safe in my surroundings. I've relinquished a lot of the guilt that I used to hold on to for not being super social. Um, there's a lot of pressures in anxiety happening. And I, I'm just curious if anyone else is feeling that too, as we start to navigate, what is this new normal? And I know we've talked about this a lot with growth day as as we're transitioning, like, what is it that we're rushing back to? What are we excited about? But how do we also protect our peace as we start to kind of explore what this new world is like and take the lessons because there has been so many valuable lessons this last year and carry them forward with us. And I truly believe that boundaries are the way that we're going to be able to do this and do so elegantly. So how many of you love Brene Brown? I am obsessed with her. I think she's absolutely brilliant. And one of my favorite quotes of hers is, daring to set boundaries is about having the courage to love ourselves even when we risk disappointing others. We can't base our own worthiness on others' approval. And this is coming from someone who spent years trying to please everyone. Only when we believe deep down that we are enough and that we can say enough. 
And I love that line from Brene because I think it's super powerful when we think about boundaries because we tend to think about boundaries in the form of disappointing others or that they're going to actually disconnect us. But the truth is, is that a lack of boundaries is what actually disconnects us from ourselves. How many of you have ever felt just out of alignment? Like your life's compass is pointing in one direction and you're going in the exact opposite. And usually when we feel that way, we can pinpoint it to places where we have been trying to please other people. We've been adding too much to our plate, or we just haven't gotten quiet enough with ourselves to ask ourselves, what direction do I want to go in? So I was talking to my team about this because I think it's really important, one, as a leader um, to understand what boundaries can look like, but two, as someone who creates a culture, which is all of you, you create a culture in your workplace with your peers, with your mentors, with your family, to understand how setting boundaries can look and also how they can be respected. So the first thing that I think about when it comes to setting boundaries is how can we protect our best yeses and start to make no our default. So when I say this, I'm coming from a place of most of us are yes people. We want to say yes to every request, every opportunity, every chance to serve, every uh, thing that we're needed. And we love to feel helpful. We love to make an impact. We love to show up for others. But what happens is, is that yes becomes our default. And so we start to overextend ourselves. How many of you have looked at your calendar and just felt dread? Like it's too full. There's too many things. I can't believe I said yes to this meeting and then baseball practice. And then I got to go here and I got to go there. When we start to protect our best yeses, like really covet them, it starts to help us make no the default. And here's what I want to share with you. I was sitting at a table the other day talking to another mother and I told her, I said, you know, I've gotten really good at saying no. And she's like, wait, tell me how, how do you say no? And I said, well, you know what? I created this template and it helps for me to communicate super clearly why I'm saying no without making the other person feel uncomfortable or that they're not worthy. And so she goes, can you send me that template? And I said, yes. So here's what the template says. Thank you so much for reaching out and sharing your idea or your vision or your request with me. I've recognized that at this time of my life, any yes that I say is an equal no to the values that I've set for myself when it comes to time, family, and energy. I want you to know I'm cheering you on and championing championing you every step of the way. But And my no is not in regards to you, how much I care about you, or your brilliant idea. It's more of me making an attempt to walk out my values in this season. And she goes, oh, wait, what? That's what you send people? And I said, yeah, that's what I send almost everyone. And she said, wow, that makes me respect you so much more. It doesn't make you, me feel less than it doesn't make me feel like my idea stinks or I'm not worthy enough of your time or your energy. It actually makes me see that people can walk the walk. And so I created templates like this that allow me to communicate that boundary in a way that shares why I'm saying no but also cheers that person on and encourages them to also set those boundaries. So one thing that I have been thinking about so much is that we all have this overarching narrative that we run through our mind constantly. And a lot of times we're really passive when it comes to it. Like we don't even realize that this narrative is running and it's telling us who we are, what we're capable of, what our purpose is. And within this big narrative, this big story that we tell ourselves about our lives, there are I mean, an infinite number of sub narratives, these tiny little stories, these tiny lines, these tiny lies that can either empower us 
or they can cause us to self-sabotage. I feel like uh, when we really get honest with ourselves and we think about the thoughts that go through our brains like a radio dial, a lot of us have this inner mean girl or this inner critic that can sometimes be incredibly loud, that can constantly be telling us that we're not enough or that we're not capable or that we're not skilled enough or valuable enough or pretty enough or skinny enough or whatever that is. Um, But what I'm inviting you to do today is like a dial on the radio to turn that inner critic down so that we can start to observe what our true mindset is, where it is rooted, and then how we can transform that as we start to move forward. So I want to tell you one quick story uh, before we dive in. So my daughter is two years old. Her name is Coco, and uh, she is just this little ball of energy. She's amazing. And every single morning when I wake her up, we always have like a little chit chat. And my daughter is slightly obsessive when it comes to cleanliness. She takes after my husband. He loves to vacuum. And one morning I saw her lick her finger and try to wipe a little mole off of her arm. She has this tiny little freckle and oh my God, I just love that freckle so much. And so I'm waking her up out of bed and I watch her lick her finger and she's just trying to get this mole gone. And it broke my heart because I was like, something in her thinks that that makes her broken or messy or or that there's something wrong with that. And so that day I told her, I said, honey, honey, look at this. This is your special spot. Only you have this spot. It is, it makes you one of a kind. It's my favorite part about you. It's so amazing. And the next morning I went in to wake her up in her crib and she wakes up and she grabs her arm and she kisses it. She kisses that spot. And every single day when I wake her up now, she greets her special spot with so much love and adoration. And she notices little tiny freckles on me and on my husband and and she kisses them because we changed the way that she thought. We changed that thought pattern. And it was super interesting because I interviewed this incredible expert in neuroplasticity and that word is so long. It almost threw me off. And, and she said that story about your daughter proves that our brains are malleable, like that we can learn and relearn thoughts and patterns that we can actually change based on our environment and our perspective. And while it's so easy for us to imagine a toddler changing the way she thinks about this special spot, imagine what it could look like for us as adults if we understood and accepted that our brain is malleable, that it can change according to our environment or our perspective. And the good news is, is that as adults, we have more control over our environment, don't we? So environmentally, we're receiving input or feedback from five to 10 people daily, which leads us to cultivating similar mindsets and belief patterns. And what we need to know about belief patterns is that both positive and negative ones can become our perspective. So I hope that that illustration kind of helps set us off as we start to kind of dig in to reframing the narrative. I I got so many takeaways from all of the other speakers and I, I learned so much, but I want to dig a little bit deeper into the stories that we tell ourselves. Um, because I think that a lot of times for me personally, and this is why I think I admire you so deeply is that I avoided mindset work for so long. I avoided it until there was no more avoiding it possible because for me, I knew that I could adopt all the systems and strategies and principles and and become this entrepreneur, but you hit a point in life where if you don't start unpacking the stories you're telling yourself, if you don't start getting really honest about the lies you're telling yourself or where your beliefs are really grounded in, you are going to max out and hit a limit that may be real or maybe just make believe. And I avoided mindset work for so long because I recognized that it would require for me to really trace back my beliefs and maybe unpack some of the harder times in life or the tragedies we've faced. And, and I know that all of us as a collective human race have all been through something challenging or hard. And so I just want to commend you. I think you are like 10 steps ahead of where I was, um, until I was forced to really say, wait, the strategies and blueprints can get me so far, but until I fix my mind and my thoughts, I'm actually not going to move forward. So 
Um, has anyone ever joined the app Headspace? It's a meditation app. I am terrible at meditating. I'm so inspired by the leaders who are like, I meditate for an hour a day. Like I like, I'm so inspired by that. It's not, it's not for me. So the, the app Headspace is kind of like meditating for dummies and, and I need it. It's like meditating for busy minds. And one of the first things that they guide you through that has really helped me when it comes to mindset is they have you close your eyes and they tell you what I want for you to do is to not shut off your brain, but to imagine your thoughts driving by on a road as cars. So each thought you has has a separate vehicle and they're just going to be driving down the road. And your job is not to judge them or redirect them. Your job is just to observe your thoughts. How many of you have thought like meditation is like not thinking it's like shutting your brain off. Right. And you're like, I can't do that. My brain is like constantly going, but meditation is actually observing. You become this active observer of your thoughts. And what was really important to me about learning that tiny little takeaway was that I can become a non-judgmental observer of my thoughts. And then I can start to connect the dots to figure out, are these thoughts rooted in feelings? Are they rooted in emotions or are they rooted in truth? And I think that when we start to unpack those things, we can start to trace through the narratives, those things that we have on loop that can really hold us back or that can propel us forward. And so what I want to invite you to start becoming is just an observer of your own thoughts of your own inner critic, of your own inner cheerleader, and of this voice. Because when we can observe without judgment, we can start to kind of break things down in a way that allows us to rebuild in a way that doesn't invoke shame or guilt. One thing I want us to think about, the main areas where we have inner dialogues are about our work life, our financial life, our relationships, our health and our abilities. And so when you think of those categories, I would challenge you to think about or write down the top area that you're struggling with the most. And so let's say you really struggle in work and you might be doubting your abilities to be able to effectively communicate. So you question yourself all the time. You question, did I say the right thing? Did I not say enough? Should I have raised my hand? Should I have spoken up? And that makes you really wonder, like, am I ever going to be a good leader? Has, can anyone relate to this? I feel like sometimes communication can be that thing where we're like, someone once told me I'm a terrible communicator and thus I must be. So whatever that story is that you're telling yourself in that area of life where you're like, I want to improve or grow here, or I want to change that narrative. I want for you to think about how can you get all of the thoughts out? This does not need to be a journal entry that you'll come back with fondness. This could be something you could burn, um, but write down all of those dialogues that you tell yourself that you believe to be true. So what is that story that you tell yourself about why you believe you are lacking or you're not effective or you're not successful in this area of life? And if we invite ourselves to gently observe our thoughts and we continually ask ourselves a question, why, you'll likely start to uncover a narrative that has been on repeat in your life. So obviously today is all about focus, flow, and productivity. How many of you feel like you are professional multitaskers, like give you a million things and like you can manage it. The busier you are, the better you are. You're the people that can like do five things at once. And your spouse or your partner says, were you even listening to me? And you can repeat back exactly what they were saying. And one of the things that when I was thinking about like, okay, what does the world need? Like, what do we need right now is that we are finishing our days and maybe I'm speaking for myself, but tell me if you're feeling this way too, where you're finishing a day and you've worked so hard and you're exhausted and you're like, wait, what did I actually accomplish? Like, I feel like I got nothing done. I actually feel more overwhelmed after working all day than actually getting things moving forward. And when I think about this last year, especially as we approach the year mark of when the world shifted and everything changes, we knew it. I'm thinking about how so many of us are wearing so many hats. 
thoughts. Um, for me, you know, I operate as a family unit. My husband and my daughter are home all the time. I have a dog under the table right now who I'm praying she doesn't bark. And we're constantly being pulled in so many directions and wearing so many different hats. And when I first became a mother, one of the biggest challenges for me was feeling like I was constantly half in on everything, whether that was work or motherhood, you know, I would be checking emails while I was nursing my baby, or, you know, I'd be up in the middle of the night and then I'd start thinking about work when I was holding my child. And, and I realized that Focus is so important, not just for us to get more done, because guess what? We're not efficiency machines. Our, our worth is not found in our output, but to feel accomplished and to finish our days, like resting our heads and saying, you know, well done, you did something today that was awesome and you moved forward and you progressed in your life. Now, one of the things that was super interesting and a study done by the American Psy Physiological Association Commission, they performed this on people trying to perform more than one task. And they realized that our mind and our brain are not naturally designed to perform in this way. And it can actually cost us. So when we are trying to multitask, it can actually cost us 40% of our productive time. So when I became a mother and I made the decision that I wanted to nurse my daughter and that was going to be part of my job for the next year of my life, I realized that I had these very short windows of time to work. And maybe you can relate to that, whether you're in a nine to five or you're working from home or you're building up your side hustle, you get these really small windows of time where you need to move the needle forward. And so if you think about the fact that multitasking can actually take away 40% of our productive time we've got to figure out ways that we can actually focus so that at the end of the day, we're saying, man, I got so much done today, or I feel really capable, or I'm feeling really confident that I was productive. So we first have to kind of break down some of the lies. One of the things that I always say, and it's not my own quote, it's someone else's, but it's busy is not a badge of honor. For so long, when you run into someone at the store, or if you're sitting down with a friend and you're like, how are you? And you're like, oh, I'm so busy. We started to like wear that and confuse that as something to be honored, that being busy meant that we must be successful or that we must be doing big things or that we must have found this secret. But being busy and being productive are two entirely different things. And I really want to make sure that we establish that difference because one, it's going to change how we show up in our own lives, but it's also going to change how we destigmatize the whole act of hustle culture and busyness. I am very focused on lifestyle in the sense of wanting to be a present mother. I want to be a great CEO. I want to be a change maker and an impact leader. But when I'm working, I want to be productive. I don't want to be busy. I was recently just talking um, to my cousin, who's a single mother of three, who had to work from home and also homeschool her children all at the same time. And I was like, I don't know how you got it done. And she's like, it's crazy how productive you can be when you know you only have a limited amount of time. And the thing that we tend to forget is that our time is a non-renewable resource. It's something that we can't go out, we can't earn more of, we can't get it back. And so I walk through life looking at time as my currency. And so when I think about time being my currency, it's super important that the ways that I'm spending it are indicative of the life that I want and the work that I'm doing. So the first thing is called a brain dump. Okay. I know it doesn't have a fancy word, but this literally has changed my life in so many ways. So have you ever felt that you have so many ideas swirling in your head? You're so overwhelmed that you don't even know how to take any action. It's almost like we're paralyzed in inaction because there's so many things we're trying to remember, so many things we know we need to do. So whenever I start to feel overwhelmed, which I'm going to be honest, even this week I was feeling this way. What I did is I opened up a blank document or took out a blank piece of paper and I wrote down every thought that was in my head. Like I almost imagine, like close my eyes and imagine the thoughts just pouring out of my head through my pen or through my keyboard. And they can be the most random thoughts. So it could be like, I need to book a pediatrician appointment for my child. I need to make sure this email gets responded to. I need to make this in my funnel and I need to 
work out, you know, like whatever it is, it's like these things that are like living in our head that are almost like bogging us down. And so brain dumps are not meant to be pretty. They're not necessarily practical, but they're this way to release these thoughts from your brain and trust that they are safe. So if I ever wake up in the middle of the night and there's something on my heart or there's something weighing on me, or there's something I'm even losing sleep over, I take the time to just really quickly write it down. I remember my grandpa always had a pad of paper by his bed and I never understood it. And he's like, my best ideas come in the middle of the night. But for me, when I can release that thought and say, okay, I know you safely exist here. I don't need to think about you until I'm ready to come back to you. It has been such a game changer for me. I think that a lot of times we worry that we're going to forget something. And so we almost keep these thoughts living in our brain as a means of like, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. But when we bog our brain down so much with all of these don't forget thoughts or all of these random things that we know we could take care of, not maybe now, but later, we're inhibiting our ability to think creatively, to think positively, to generate new ideas. So one of my team members, Kylie, she said that she does this every Sunday. So if you get the Sunday scaries, if Monday approaching kind of freaks you out and you're like, man, I'm about to start this new week and I have so much on my plate and I don't know if I can get it done. What she does is she drops everything onto a list or a document, or even we have like an organizational tool that we use inside of our company called Monday. It's basically a project management software, but basically she's like, I break down everything that's in my brain and I assign each task to a day of the week. And what she said, she said, it's great reassurance when I see a stack of tasks or projects that give me that overwhelmed, like I have so much to do feeling. And when I see that they actually can fit into my week and that I have plenty of time to accomplish them. So one of the biggest things to remember is this doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be a bulleted list. It can literally be just releasing these thoughts from your mind to free up your energy and your time and your brain space to think about other things. And so brain dump is one of the best things you can do. And if you work with a team or if you have a spouse or a partner, sharing that brain dump can sometimes help people say, wait, I can help with that. Or, oh, you're worried about that? Let me take care of that. And so it's also a gentle way to learn how to start asking for help or to let people in when you are overwhelmed. Um, I will share this with my husband sometimes because he is like the homemaker. He does the cooking and the cleaning. He watches our child. Um, He's amazing. And so sometimes it's like the littlest things are driving me crazy, like sending the check out to this person or things. And he's like, I can do that for you. And so it's a great way to also learn how to ask for help, which allows of times we're really bad at. Confidence is this journey. It's this constant learning and changing and ebbing and flowing. And there's so much about it. And so I don't believe that there is a one size fits all statement about confidence that is going to be true for all of us. The thing that I think that can be true for all of us is that confidence shows up for each of us, when we can finally say, I am me, I know exactly who I am, and frankly, I like it. And that thought alone is so freeing because it's not marked by anyone else's interpretation of confidence. It's not marked by anyone else's belief of what we should be or how we should act or how we should perform or what we should do. I was researching about confidence and there is this amazing woman named Evelyn Marinoff and she researches and writes about the psychology behind confidence. And I think it's super interesting. So get this, men's self-esteem tends to move in this upward linear projection. So just kind of picture this, men are moving upward and it's very linear, while women have more variable trajectories and experience frequent ups and downs in their self-worth levels. How many of you can relate to this, whether you're a man or a woman? I thought this was so, so interesting. And so That makes men more stable in their own self-opinions, while for women, it's truly this blend of nature and nurture that shapes our sense of worth. And the good thing is, like, I honestly see this fact as a win because we all want to make more improvement. We want to mold our own self-opinions. And the thing that is exciting about confidence is that we can improve it. 
right? It's this soft skill that often gets downplayed when you think about when you are applying for a job or when you're telling people what you're good at, we always lean on the hard, the hard skills that we have, whether, you know, it's education or we're proficient in something. And confidence is this soft skill that often flies under the radar, but I believe that confidence can change every facet of our life. And it's good because we can improve it. There are studies that have shown that. And so there are so many different factors that can really influence our confidence level and our unique environments and our histories, specifically our upbringing, where we grew up, our parental care, our quality of education have this large impact on shaping our levels of confidence. So one other study found that later in life, nature's effect was 40% and 60% was about nurture. And I think about this a lot as a mother, because I think about how I'm bringing up my daughter and how I want to instill confidence in her and how what I do as a mother, how I instill that confidence is going to attribute for about 40% of what she believes to be true about herself and for herself. But it also gives a lot of hope because there that leaves room for 60% of our confidence levels to be nurtured. I believe that confidence shows up in three different ways in our lives. Confidence shows up in who we are. So my grandmother, I talked to her yesterday on the phone and she is struggling with memory loss, but she still has these very vivid memories from my childhood. And every time I talk to my grandma, she always tells the same story. And I was five years old. I was laying in bed with her and she looked at me and I had my hands like this on my face. And my grandma said, Jenna, what makes you so beautiful? And I looked at her, I didn't even pause. And I said, well, that's just how God made me. And my grandma tells me this story every single time I talk to her and I hear this story over and over again. And it reminds me of that childlike confidence that I had at this young age because I knew who I was and I also knew who created me. And no matter what you believe, I think that there's something so powerful in feeling connected that we were made in some sort of vision. So first, I believe that confidence shows up in who we are. It's that innate in ingrained confidence that we just carry naturally. And those are likely the things that we have had confidence in since we were a child. So the first one is confidence in who we are. But the second one is confidence in what we know. So when I became a mother two years ago, I remember leaving the hospital and thinking to myself, I can't believe they're just letting me walk out the doors with this child. Has anyone felt like that? Like, you're like, where is the college degree that tells me I'm equipped to care for another human being? And it's funny because now two years into the game, I find myself feeling like an expert in the experience I've lived and being able to contribute to other people who are experiencing things that I once experienced and had questions on. And so number two is confidence in what we know. And confidence is formed in so many different ways in our life. We are constantly students of life and there is no other community I'd rather be a part of because you guys see how important it is to be a student, to continue growing through life. And I'm right there with you. And so sometimes the lessons are the things that we learn in formal classrooms with the fluorescent lights, but sometimes, and most of the time, the lessons are the things that life has taught us. When we soak in what we consume, we start to grow a level of confidence in what we know. And I want for you to really think about this one because a lot of times we lean on more of the formal education, but I want to think about the things that life has taught you, the lessons that life has shown you, the things that you found yourself researching in forums at three in the morning because you need answers, because you likely know a lot more than you give yourself credit for. And in that knowing, you get to to show up with more confidence. Now, number three is confidence in how we can impact. This leans on a statement that I like to say, which is who I am and what I do. 
Have you ever noticed that a lot of times when people take the stage or they're hosting a community or you land on a website even, a lot of times people will say, this is who I am, this is how I serve or who I serve and this is how I serve them. And I think that there's so much confidence in almost having that own mission statement for your life. And so when I look at the people who are out there who are really set on making the biggest impact, it's those who can confidently tell you, this is who I am, this is what I do, and this is how I serve the world. The deeper that we understand and feel confidence in our gifts, the greater our impact is. And I love that. So just to reiterate, the three things that I think can influence our confidence and that ways that confidence shows up in our lives are confidence in who we are, confidence in what we know, and confidence in how we can impact. This can be your day for personal growth. This can be that day you committed to and you remember you go, that was the day I got myself a community. I got better coaches. I committed to making my life the absolute best that I could. This is that day. Make today your growth day. Click the button on this page and sign up right now.